Hello everyone. Welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, May 16th. I'm one of the show hosts, Lori Moffat, along with Peggy George and Tammy Moore. Thanks to Tammy for doing closed captioning. Today's topic is how to help your visual students learn using movie magic. And we have a special guest with us today, Sydney Sharon, who's a ninth grade high school student. And I'm going to turn the mic over to Peggy, who will further introduce Sydney. Well, hello to all of you. It is so great to have you with us. And we are so excited to have Sydney Sharon with us today. I first met, and I say met because it was online, Sydney in the Student Technology Conference that Steve Hargadon hosted back in January. And I was so impressed with her presentation and her inspiration that I just knew we had to invite her onto our show so more of you would get the opportunity to hear from her. And she said yes. So today, Sydney is here to share some wonderful ideas and resources and information about the importance of using video in your classrooms. Sydney is a ninth grade student at West Hampton Beach High School. She actually created and ran the middle school's newsletter. She is currently the freshman class president. And her passion for filmmaking has led her to even screen one of her movies at the local movie theater. Is that exciting or what? Um, she has attended the New York Film Academy for the past two summers. And <clears throat> she has also been selected to be a student keynote speaker at the Suffolk Asset Conference. And I've included a couple of things about that in our live finder today. You are going to be so inspired by her and all of the things she has been doing with technology from very early on. And I want to say a warm welcome to Sydney and move on to our newbie question and turn this over to her. So our newbie question is, why is movie making so important for students and teachers? Take it away, Sydney. Thank you so much, Peggy. Um, this is a great question and is exactly what I will be discussing in today's presentation. Technology is something that is rapidly becoming more and more relevant. And visual media is a large portion of this new technology that people are consuming, which is why movies should be brought into the classroom. How often do you watch the news on TV? You may not even realize that by doing this, you are learning history. By translating this process of viewing information into the classroom, you are helping students, especially when students spend many of their hours outside of school engaged with visual media, whether it's TV or YouTube or digital streaming. So now we are going to move into the presentation. Hi everyone, my name is Sydney Sharon again. And welcome to How to Help Your Visual Students Learn Using Movie Magic. Like Peggy said, I'm a 14-year-old freshman from West Hampton Beach High School, an Apple Distinguished School. For those of you who do not know, West Hampton is on the eastern end of Long Island, which is about an hour and a half from New York City. Our small beach community is very popular among tourists and celebrities and is often shown on TV shows. Today, we are going to go beyond iMovie to teach you how to use movie magic to help visual students learn. So to start, I'm going to tell you a little about myself and how I got started making movies. I'm a ninth grade student at West Hampton Beach High School, and I absolutely love technology, and I love making movies. I was a keynote speaker at the Student Technology Conference held in January. I was the youngest of three student keynote speakers, 
selected to speak at the Suffolk Asset Conference for a crowd of over 700 people during one of the largest technology conferences for teachers and administrators on the island this past March. I attended New York Film Academy twice over the past two summers, and I've shown a film of mine at the local movie theater. Basically, making movies is my passion, and this passion of making films, it started in the classroom. In the fourth grade, the school gave us our own MacBook computers, and the first time that I ever used iMovie was on a class project about the Everglades. The Everglades. Welcome to the Florida Everglades, also known as the River of Grass. Spanning the southern tip of the Florida Peninsula, the Everglades is the largest remaining subtropical wilderness in the United States. The project was simple. A series of pictures with audio that I recorded in the background, some text here and there, and of course, a breakbeat music track, which is essentially the simplest and most commonly used audio file in the entirety of the iLife sound effects. What I'm trying to say is that this project was as simple as you can get, but it led me to learn how to push the boundaries of iMovie. To me, the project wasn't about the Everglades. It was an introduction to iMovie and an introduction to the art that I have devoted much of my time learning. In this presentation, I want to teach you how to push the boundaries, because you never know which student might be the next Steven Spielberg. We are going beyond iMovie, meaning this is not an iMovie tutorial. It is more than that. I will be discussing iMovie as an example because it is a commonly used editing program. It is free and pre-installed on any Mac computer. But this presentation is about bringing visual media into the classroom in any format, whether you are using iMovie, Final Cut, Windows Movie Maker, Adobe Premiere, or any other movie editing program out there. This is a presentation to teach why you should bring movie magic into the classroom. I will be discussing four major topics throughout the course of the presentation. Creating your own media, real world applications, lectures versus videos, and easily understanding other applications. First, let's start with creating your own media. One of the many benefits of making movies to enhance your learning experience is that the media is created by you. Unlike making your own PowerPoint, writing an essay, or creating flashcards, forming a movie presentation involves all of the senses that help students to study. You are writing out the information, reading it, speaking it, listening to it, and watching it. First, you write the script. This process involves research and an understanding of the topic. Once you have read over and edited the script, the camera is set up for filming. Now you are speaking the topic. Throughout the many takes of filming, you may have read the information five to ten times, perhaps even more. The facts are beginning to imprint themselves in your brain. When the editing process begins, you are listening, watching the clips over and over again. By now, you probably know what you are about to say next in the video as you watch it. When the film is ready to be shared and exported, you have a firm understanding of the entire topic. This process of repetition helps to instill the facts into your mind. Rather than typing facts out once, reading them once, and presenting them once, you are utilizing almost all of your senses in repetition 
to help comprehend the topic at hand. I always utilize this process to make my films for school. In my seventh grade social studies project, we were asked to create a news report about a specific Indian tribe. My group chose the Mandan Indian tribe. We spent time in class creating a script and planning what we would film. Then we went home and shot our movie. We even experimented by using a green screen for the first time. I edited the project together and it was ready to show the class. Here, I have a short clip of the video. Welcome back to Channel Negative 5 History News. We now interrupt the following report with some breaking news. What is it, Janet? I'm glad you asked, Bill. When we showed this project to the class, we had a great reaction because it was fun to watch and a new way to receive the information. Next, we will be moving on to easily understanding other applications. Using iMovie gives students the basic skills that they need to have the ability to use other editing programs and applications. Once you understand how to edit with iMovie, it is easy to begin using other programs, including GarageBand, QuickTime, Final Cut Pro, Motion, and many other computer programs, including, but definitely not limited, to other editing programs. iMovie is considered one of the most basic editing softwares for Mac computers. It is a free program and pre-installed on any Mac device. Because the West Hampton Beach School District is an Apple Distinguished School, we often work on our Mac and use all of the programs available to us. An iMovie project can be as simple or as difficult as you choose. The program teaches the users the basics of importing media. This image shows how you can import media by clicking the downward facing arrow button on the top of the window using transitions, which can be added simply by clicking and dragging your choice from the transitions menu. Working with text in videos, similar to transitions, text can be added by clicking and dragging your selection from the menu. And audio and video cropping. This can be done by clicking the end of a clip and dragging it to your desired point. These are all simple tasks which can be done by clicking and dragging clips. When a user becomes skilled with the basics, then they move on to using more difficult settings such as creating a side-by-side -side clip by dragging one video above the other in the timeline and then selecting side-by-side -side in the video overlay settings drop-down menu. A picture-in-picture -picture clip Rather than selecting side-by-side -side in the video overlay settings, now select picture-in-picture. Picture. Using fast or slow motion, highlight the video you want to edit and then choose your desired playback speed under modify on the top menu bar. And experimenting with instant replays. Similar to creating a slow or fast motion effect, go to the Modify section of the top menu bar and then scroll to Instant Replay, where you can choose your desired playback speed. Learning all of these skills helps the user in different aspects of different programs. In GarageBand, 
it is important to know how to cut clips where you want, like in iMovie. Everything that the user learned using iMovie can be incorporated into their use of Final Cut Pro. When I exhausted my use of iMovie, the next step in editing was Final Cut. This editing program is very similar to iMovie, yet has more features and is a more advanced program. In this next video that I'm going to show you, I experimented with green screen effects. For the seventh grade Spanish project, I'm acting as both myself and the girl in the blonde wig. But the boy in the clip is in fact not me, but rather my twin brother Adam, whom you may have noticed appears in many of my films. Hola, yo soy Sydney. Yo soy de los Estados Unidos. Yo soy americana. Yo soy una persona buena. Yo soy morena. This short clip is an example of how I was able to overlay one clip on top of another using a green screen. From here, I've gone on to incorporate the use of a green screen into many more of my movie projects. iMovie skills even help when you are typing a paper on pages or working on a keynote. While using iMovie, it is common to begin using keyboard shortcuts. For example, to export a project, you hold down Command-E. The Pages and Keynote applications both have many keyboard shortcuts to use. Command-C is copy, and Command-V is paste to name a couple. Next, we have real-world applications. When creating your movies, you are not just learning skills to help with other computer applications. You are learning skills that can be applied to the real world. The editing process involves the creator to use trial and error, a skill that is important to learn for the entirety of one's life. While working on a film, Everything does not always go as planned. This requires quick thinking and creative ideas so that the editing process or filming process can be continued as efficiently as possible. Oftentimes, while working on a film, you need to try new things, new angles and effects. If the idea does not work, then you learn to have a backup plan. These are processes that are also followed in everyday life, school, and the workplace. Making movies has caused me to develop a hardworking, creative mindset. When I make a film, it is up to me to carry out the process and to finish the project through. If I don't schedule to film, there is no movie. If I don't edit, there is no movie. Yet. While this process teaches how to work independently, it also encourages collaboration. I always bounce ideas for a project off of other people, always involve others to act and help behind the camera. Each and every one of these skills, working collaboratively, being a hard worker, learning trial and error skills, helps to prepare a student for the future out of school working or in school. The following clip is a sixth grade health project that I decided to make a stop motion video for. The video was supposed to be a quick message about the dangers of drinking and driving. This was only my second attempt at using stop motion, so the process was filled with all of the skills that one learns while filmmaking. Quick thinking, trial and error, creative ideas, and trying new things. For our last topic, we will be discussing lectures versus videos. Say you've just walked into my classroom. I'm your science teacher, and we will be studying 
radiation. Would you rather me teach you with a PowerPoint presentation like this? Showing facts on slides, just words, words, and more words with a picture here and there in the corner. Or would you rather watch this project I made for science class in the eighth grade? Radiation can move through empty space and has no defined medium. Our marshmallows will be melted and s'mores heated from the electromagnetic energy being created by the microwave. An entertaining video filled with information yet presented in an engaging way. Both formats have the exact same information, but they are presented in different ways. Most students interpret the information better when it is presented as a movie. The study by David Cooper Moore and Teresa Redman proved, as they said, that leveraging mass media and popular culture texts, which young adolescents consume daily as texts for study in the classroom, connects fundamental literacy practices in school with middle-level students' everyday media experiences outside of school, which, simply put, means that when we teach students using the media and the popular culture that they are used to and that they enjoy while out of school, it enhances their learning experience while in school. In our generation of the technology age, kids are always on the internet, and many spend that time watching videos on YouTube. The average adolescent will even spend up to 12 hours of the day being engaged with media. In Richard Beach and Frank Baker's study about embracing media literacy through the Common Core, they quoted the National Council of Teachers of English stating that viewing and visually representing are a part of our growing consciousness of how people gather and share information. This statement is reinforcing the knowledge that in our world today and our future, Visual media is a main source of information. Students are comfortable watching movies and obtaining information in that fashion. So why not bring this method into the classroom? When we show a student a video, it will relate with them better. We are bringing in characters and a story is being told. A story, meaning when a student sees a person on the screen, even if they are just speaking definitions, the experience of watching them say the words sticks in their minds. Visual learners like to see images, and movies provide those for us. This, me this, method, of bringing, this method of learning brings characters from history or stories out of the text and onto the screen. Schools have to change because students learn differently than they did 10 years ago. Today, everything is on the internet. We have access to all of the knowledge in the world at the press of a button. By teaching students how to use technology in class and enforcing proper learning habits with technology, we are enhancing a student's learning experience. Videos can be watched over and over again, but a lecture is only presented once. Rather than not utilizing it, take advantage of all of the technology available to people now and utilize the visual media of movies in class. This last video that I'm going to show you was a project for my eighth grade critical literacy class but is by far one of my favorite videos that I have made for school so far. For this assignment, we were instructed to make a movie book trailer. My group chose an ebook called Complex 13, written by Matthew Riley. We spent time in class writing a script and planning what we would film. I went through the short story and highlighted specific scenes and quotes that would be ideal for using in the trailer. The video was filmed at my house, but a portion of the film was shot on location with a real helicopter. I filmed different types of shots 
and experimented with my editing, utilizing new techniques and having fun with the process. For a short 15 seconds of the trailer, I even used 14 layers of audio tracks to create a true immersive feeling of an alien monster attack, as you will soon see. The most rewarding experience of the entire project was showing it to our class and seeing everyone's reactions. This is an example of how the basic skills, the fire that was ignited inside me in the fourth grade, how all of that has evolved to become a piece of art that I, as a filmmaker, am very proud of. Here, I have my favorite film that I have made for school to show you. There are several great military myths out there. One of the most well-known is the Area 51 myth. that the United States Air Force holds a crashed alien spacecraft and the aliens that arrived in it. Interesting conspiracy theories, yes, but one myth has long prevailed over them all. A legend which many in the United States intelligence community swear is true. It was they who heard the radio intercepts of whispered, frightened Russian voices speaking of the prison of no return. of a place named Complex 13. When creating this presentation, I was instructed to find a way to inspire people. I thought about this for hours on end, trying to figure out how I could inspire people. I knew what I wanted to discuss on my slides. I had my facts, but this little seven-letter word kept popping up in my mind, inspire. Then it hit me. My goal today was not to teach you how to use iMovie. It was to teach you why you should make movies. You don't need a fancy camera or a green screen or even iMovie to be exact. All you need is passion. So I'm replacing one seven-letter word with another because to inspire, you need passion. I started the presentation telling you that I have a passion for filmmaking. And ever since the fourth grade, using a computer for a camera, I've had this passion, this enthusiasm. Each and every time I make a film has lasted for nearly six years and counting. It has led me to countless opportunities, both in and out of school. I wouldn't be here talking to you if I hadn't pursued making movies. Filmmaking is fun. I have never spoken to another student who didn't want to be in the film or at least a part of one. By introducing films into the classroom, you may be the person to inspire a student and ignite their passion. Like I said earlier, you never know which student might be the next Steven Spielberg. Thank you all for listening today. Thank you to Lori Mafat, Tammy Moore, Peggy George, and the Classroom 2.0 group for inviting me here today to speak to everyone. This slide contains some of my contact information, including the link to my YouTube page. While you are thinking of some questions, I'm going to show a few pictures from some of the events that I have mentioned and that have truly impacted this presentation and myself as a person. This picture is from when I premiered my movie rendition of The Hunger Games at the local theater. Lots of people came and we raised over $700 for St. Jude's Children's Fund. This is one of my favorite pictures from when I was at NIFA. Both of the pictures were taken, were actually taken in the same place before I went home after an amazing experience. 
Here is where I spoke from during the Student Technology Conference. We had three groups of students speaking from my school, so we all met in the middle school where they set up a computer and this really cool backdrop. And finally, some photos from when I spoke at the Suffolk Asset Conference, which was an amazing experience, and I got the chance to speak in front of around 700 people. And then later we went and had a question and answer session. Thanks so much, Sydney. I did capture some questions along the way. Uh, do you have a favorite place for finding tutorials for the tools that you use? If I'm looking for tutorials, I usually just go onto YouTube and mm -hmm. look at the top hits. Okay. Okay. Uh, do students really want to see their teachers on video? Making movies for the classroom is not just for students to see the teachers. It's mm -hmm. also for students to see each other. Mm -hmm. um, Students always find it uh, entertaining when they see their teachers and their students both on the screen. OK. This, that was from one of the teachers who was reluctant to be on video. Um, how do you create the scrolling text, the text that scrolls from right to left at the bottom of the video screen? That is actually in Final Cut. Mm -hmm. That's a text template. So iMovie, I think iMovie has that one. I'm not exactly sure. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of different options for text. So you just drag and drop the text onto the video. And then you type it in as if you were using a template on pages or Word. OK, so the, the program takes care of that once you put in the text. Yes. OK. Um, but programs, programs like Motion mm -hmm. are for text editing. So with Motion, you make your own text templates. OK. With the book trailer, uh, how much time did it take you to prepare and create and publish that? The book trailer took, it took about two days to write the script. We worked in class, and then we worked after school writing the script for the video and looking at the book itself, which is actually a 15-page ebook, which hmm. can be downloaded from the internet. Mm -hmm. And then everyone came to my house, and it took a day to film the majority of the film, mm -hmm. and, which was actually filmed in my basement, in different locations in the basement. And then the part with the helicopter, one of my friends, his dad works at the air base, okay. so we were allowed to go and film with the helicopter on another day. And then editing takes another two days to finish that and get it up on YouTube. Great. Um, what kind of camera do you normally use? Uh, this person says many kids use their phones now for video. I typically use a Panasonic HMC40, which mm -hmm. is a professional video camera that we used in New York Film Academy. Mm -hmm. um, video, I have used iPhone videos. The quality of those videos, of course, doesn't look as great. Right. Um, Canon cameras also work great. I've used those often. Mm -hmm. And computer cameras. A lot of them are um, better than they used to be. Mm. Do you want to do filmmaking as a career or major? Honestly, I'm not sure what I want to do. Uh -huh. I love film, and mm -hmm. I would love to go into the film industry. But I also have a lot of other interests. OK, I have a couple more. Uh, you mentioned that technology defines you. What do you mean by that? Well, I say technology defines me because I try to incorporate a piece of technology, uh, use my phone, the internet, use YouTube videos into almost everything I do. Mm -hmm. So my notes for the presentation today, I was 
those were on my iPad. I was reading off of my iPad for that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, what was your experience at New York Film Academy like? That was an amazing experience. Uh, the first time I went was a younger course for tweens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was that was a very it was an advanced but basic outline. So mm -hmm. the second year I went was more advanced. So the first time I went was new ideas. They taught us about shots and using shots. So that's when I learned about shots. Mm -hmm. But then when I went the second time, it was a teen group. So it was all kids in high school. And that was great. We spent, both programs, you spend a week making a film. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um, what are some of your other interests? I love writing. That's why I created the newsletter in my school. Mm -hmm. um, reading and writing. I, I really like history. It's one of my favorite classes. I try to stay well-rounded at school. So um, I, I like everything. Um, mm -hmm. One of my hidden talents that people don't really know about, I juggle. Hmm. Which I actually learned how to juggle from YouTube. Okay. So YouTube can teach you to do a whole lot of things. Yes. Uh, let's see. When you in, in fourth grade, when you started with your video skills, were there teachers that were making videos, or did you just get hooked by watching some others? My fourth grade teacher had a film degree. Mm -hmm. So she, we were doing the Everglades project. Right. And so she taught us how to use iMovie. And we filmed the videos with our computers. And just the process and the ability of turning my words into images, mm -hmm. and not just images, moving images, really just hooked me in. So we had free time every Friday, and every Friday I would make a video. Mm -hmm. OK. That's, that's wonderful. That's a great story. Uh, those were the questions I was able to capture, although I think somebody did ask about how do you set up your green screen. Setting up the green screen is it's a large process. The green screen, I bought a green screen kit, and it comes with a uh, stand for the green screen. Mm -hmm. So you set that up like two tripods, which are big with a large bar across the top, which the green screen goes onto. So then you take, with the green screen, you need to have the right lighting. So I have two lights that came with the kit, which you focus on, you focus on the screen. Mm -hmm. And if the green screen has too much, if you can see through the green screen, that means there's too much lighting, mm -hmm. in which case you want to lessen the light. Because then on the video, when you go to edit, there will be a lot of fuzzies, like little fuzz on the video, which mm -hmm. in some of the videos that I showed today, it has a little of that because it was my first videos. But now, as I use green screen more, there's less and less of that. And you can get rid of, in the editing, um, some of the green if there's a little green line around your body. Mm -hmm. As Doug Henry mentioned about using plastic tablecloths, whether blue or green, f instead of the cloth background. That would probably work. You would just have to make sure that the light does not reflect off of the screen. Right. And that it's the right color because some programs, I know iMovie, it's hard to detect the cover, so you want to make sure you're using the chroma green or the chroma blue colors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, in Final Cut, you can select the color that you want to use for the background. So you just have to check with your editing program and your lighting. Mm -hmm. Do you edit your films in an application or in a program? I use the program on my computer. I use Final Cut Pro. Mm -hmm. um, not There are two different versions of that. There's Final Cut Pro and Pro X. Pro X, they don't sell anymore, but a lot of professional movie makers like to use that. I personally like the Final Cut Pro better 
But when I went to New York Film Academy, that's what they, they use Final Cut Pro X. Mm -hmm. OK. Well, again, thanks so much. I think I did manage to ask all the questions that were in chat. Thank you all. We're going to go ahead and wrap. Sorry, Sydney. Uh, we're going to wrap up, but I think I'm going to turn the mic over to Peggy for the upcoming shows that we have. Thank you so much, Sydney. That was a wonderful, inspiring presentation. And I loved all the answers to the questions, too. It's just it's so great to hear from the student perspective about some of the behind the scenes stuff that goes on. And I'm inspired by the fact that you got started at such a young age. Because so many teachers think, oh, well, our kids are too young to do that. But you're living proof that we're not. So thank you so much. We have some great shows coming up. But we do have to remind you that next week, we we will not have a show because that's Memorial Day weekend in the United States. But the following week, we have a great show coming up with Latia Cooper. And you may know her as Tech with Tia. And she's going to share a fabulous live binder with us. That, and it's a huge live binder for STEM. But she's going to focus entirely on her science websites. So that will be websites, tools, and apps. And it will be great. Then on June 6th, Lisa Johnson, tech chef for you, will be sharing Canva with us, an amazing tool that I know you're going to love. And on June 13th, we're going to do the Math Playground. They've got some fabulous new updates there, both apps and um, web games for kids. And Colleen King and Bob Sprankle will be joining us for that. So I hope you'll come back and join us for all of those shows. Back to you, Lori. Thank you. The Learning Revolution Project is Steve Hargadon's latest venture. He's gathered together all of his resources for professional development in one place. And he also has the Host Your Own Webinar at the Learning Revolution Project. Uh, that's where you can sign up for a Blackboard Collaborate room. And as long as you make your session public, your, your webinar that you host is free. You can nominate a featured teacher at this URL. Uh, each month we have a featured teacher for the month. You can even nominate yourself as a featured teacher. As you exit the session, the Classroom 2.0 Live survey should open up in your browser. Or you can click on the link in the chat box, which will be there shortly. You can also click the tab in the resources section at the bottom of the live binder. The link for the survey is there as well. When you do get the survey link, at the very bottom there are two fields to request the professional development certificate. One is for your name, and your name actually prints right on the certificate now, and it has for a few months. Uh, also make sure that the email that you use to request this is a personal email account rather than a school email address. Most schools will block this from ever getting to you. So if you, didn't, if you don't get a certificate, it could be because it's been blocked. The archives are available in both audio and video at the iTunes U channel for Classroom 2.0 Live as well as you can subscribe to the RSS feed for archives. So there are many ways to get to the show archives, of course, from going right to the, the website. The archives are there as well. Again, special thanks today to Sydney Sharon, to Steve Hargadon for uh, founding Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education, and the Learning Revolution, to Weebly.com for 
providing our website to Blackboard Collaborate for our webinar platform. And to everyone who participated in today's show, thank you so much for coming.